Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeff Vandermeer to the stage. We have, a, we have a lot to go through, so I hope you pay attention. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, thanks for the lovely uh, intro. I assume my mic is working. Uh, thanks to the library. Thanks to all the sponsors of the library. And thanks uh, to you for coming out tonight. Um, how are you, Birmingham? Are you doing well? Have you had a good week? Are you in a receptive mood for an event such as this, I hope? <laughs> um, so tonight is kind of in a way about how fiction and reality collide because they've collided in some kind of unusual ways over the last few years for me. Uh, and then also, I've had seven books out in seven years, which is a kind of brutal schedule. So I may, I may wax a bit nostalgic, which is always dangerous uh, for an audience. So I'm just warning you in advance. This is also my first gig away from home uh, in a very long time. <laughs> so kindness is appreciated. Um, anything could happen. Uh, well, not anything, just anything that can happen on a stage. Um, so I hope you're willing to help me set expectations uh, fairly low since you already uh, have been shouting things out. I'm wondering if I can get a shout of I blame Vandermeer because I will in fact be responsible for anything bad that happens tonight. Are you up for that? Can I hear I blame Vandermeer? Wow, that is lukewarm. <laughs> those are two, those expectations are way too high. I blame Vandermeer. That's, that's not bad. Um, I do want to kind of record this for posterity or whatever, if you don't mind. So one last time on the count of three. One, two, three. I'm okay, that was a little too much. Like, I think it's going to be a little better than, than you expect from, from that. Um, uh, <laughs> So anyway, um, reality versus fantasy and how they get kind of screwed up and kind of um, entangled. Um, what happens when you write a work of fiction and you let it out uh, into the world? Well, all sorts of, like I said, unexpected things. Uh, for example, Annihilation is not the first time that I wrote about uh, Florida. Uh, long before the Southern Trilogy, uh, Southern Reach Trilogy. <laughs> It's been out so long, I can't even remember the name of it. I was known for writing stories set in an imaginary city uh, called Ambergris, inspired by Borges and Calvino and a bunch of others. And in this uh, city, there was a celebration called the Festival of the Freshwater Squid, a cornucopia for the senses, a cultural highlight for the city. And I wrote about this fantastical uh, festival for years without anything particularly odd uh, happening. What did happen tended to fall into one of three categories. Dried squid, tons and tons of dried squid, uh, more dried squid than there are undried squid. Every year without fail, people sent me dried squid in the mail. And never the same people, I must add. This was not a single dried squid uh, individual. Now, I don't actually like to eat squid, but it's the thought that disturbs me, um, especially the fact that there were so many pounds of it coming to the door. Uh, category the second, uh, pictures of squid, hand-drawn, cut out of magazines, photocopied evidence of squid. And I'm tempted to say I already knew what squid looked like, um, but the truth is I didn't because there are so many different kinds, but now I do. And category the third, squid sightings all over the world in every language posted on a myriad of websites. If it makes the news, even to this day, I know about it. Sent the link all day long from dozens and dozens of people. Look, a squid has been sighted. We thought you'd like to know. And then the subtext, which is, are you going to do something about it? <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, so I bear witness to squid sightings. It is my burden. It is my talent. It is still ongoing. I've been unable to monetize it on YouTube. Um, but I'm touched. I am actually touched by this. It's just, what am I supposed to do with this information? And yet, this activity all existed in the realm of the containable and the hugely flattering people had read my books and taken out, taken time away from their busy day of doing good deeds, robbing banks or going to get groceries to send me stuff or to email me. And then things changed because I kind of changed the paradigm. I flipped the reality versus the fantasy and I brought my festival of the freshwater squid into the real world. 
And how could I let that happen? How could I be that irresponsible? Well, let me explain. I'd had the experience of traveling around small town Florida uh, for a day job and experienced this endless array of craft fairs, art shows, and yes, small town festivals. And I developed a strange affection for these events. They were genuine. They weren't that commercial. People enjoyed them. They were kind of the anti-Disney. And so I decided to lovingly send them up uh, Mark Twain style. I decided to write about a made up festival. And I set it in Sebring, Florida, in the center of the state during the, the summer. I thought I was doing them a favor because they don't have any tourist industry in the summer. Uh, I wrote about it as if I were a reporter doing an article uh, for a newspaper, but I was also a biologist. <laughs> and I lacked only one thing, squid, freshwater squid. So I did a lot of research and I created the mayfly squid. And as you may or may not know, the tiny freshwater squid is an invasive species brought to Florida by mistake on container ships from Brazil. Now it lives in the lakes in and around Sebring, a whole industry and subculture growing up around it, nurturing it. T-shirts, plastic glow-in-the-dark squid keychains, self-published tell-all guides to the squid and festivities. The festival starts with a parade through town after which the mayfly squid queen in her glowing tiara, flashing neon dress and her special clear plastic hollow platform shoes goes out onto the lake in a special squid boat. Have I mentioned that her shoes are filled with squid? Once on the lake, the mayfly squid queen releases <laughs> the squid from her shoes into the water just in time for the mating season. On some level, I just can't believe I'm even relating this to you. Well, back on shore, <laughs> well, back, it's a weird feeling to have while you're in the middle of a presentation. Uh, while back on shore, the celebration has already started. Drunk tourists wearing squid hats, eating squid ink ice cream, keeping chiropractors in business by allowing themselves to be wrenched around for five minutes at a time on squid-shaped amusement rides. So this was harmless fun, right? The results were published on a fiction website complete with diagrams and photographs and footnotes to scholarly essays from scientific journals. End of story, except it wasn't. Two rather strange things happened, one quickly, one slowly. Strange situation the first, an angry email, an irate phone call, both from a cephalopod expert at the University of Texas in Galveston Online research, my story, the page detailing the physiology and mating habits of the mayfly squid. As he read this page, the cephalopod expert became more and more indignant. A rage arose within him as he realized with mounting horror that I had created a whole new squid. Indeed, something never seen before, a freshwater squid. Do you know just how difficult squid taxonomy already is, he asked me. <laughs> Don't go screwing around with people's heads with your... And the contempt in these last words before he hung up the phone cannot be overstated. Fake squid. <laughs> I do feel a little guilty about that. Strange situation the second. Over a period of two or three years, unbeknownst to me, bewildering several, the Sebring Chamber of Commerce began to get some mighty strange phone calls and emails. When will the festival of the freshwater squid be held this year? Do you have a brochure about the event? Is it family friendly? Freshwater what? Squid festival? <laughs> First brought to my attention when the local Sebring newspaper called to set up an interview about the situation. <laughs> um, <laughs> resulting in a much more explicit this is fiction warning on each page of the online story, which I always thought was kind of a shame. That blurring between the fantastical and the real world, it's more honest about the facts of the real world and about what might be called fantasy and where it comes from. As for the Festival of the Freshwater Squid, things only got worse. A fisherman in Louisiana contacted me, leaving a message on the answering machine. I still have no idea how he got my phone number. He had seen a squid in a lake in Louisiana, and he thought that it was probably a mayfly squid. Another person from Mississippi posted on angler message boards to alert people to the fact that the mayfly squid was heading north. He had seen it. He had caught two in a swamp. This must be stopped. And if you uh, type in to Google freshwater squid, you will still find that message board and that message. Then, and a lot of debate. So then nothing happened for a while. And then two years after that, a BBC wildlife show producer emailed me. And she said she was gonna be in the Everglades anyway with a crew. And could she come up to Sebring and film me walking around the lakes 
talking about the mayfly squid, and maybe we would even see one. Um, and so I was tempted. You know, I, I don't believe in heaven or hell. Um, I knew a guy who could make a rubber model. I had a friend with a scuba suit. <laughs> I was really, really tempted. <laughs> but I rather thought it might end badly, too. It might become too real. And besides, my conscience, uh, i.e. my wife, uh, said it was a terrible <laughs> idea <laughs> that she would not support financially or any other way. <laughs> Um, the BBC producer was at least rightly horrified, uh, and I'm sure that she in future would, you know, not just do a random Google search and then decide to go to the middle of Florida. Um, the moral of this particular story, I don't know what the moral is, to be honest, but it cured me of writing about Florida for a long time, and it made me think about how am I going to write about Florida, <laughs> because I thought I'd been doing so in a responsible way, but in fact, I had not. Um, can I get a blame, Vandermeer? I blame Ben. Yeah, you, I don't believe you. Uh, that's okay. I had it down here. All right, settle down, but I didn't need it. Uh, so, oh, and I forgot to show you that slide from the article. <laughs> so I did still want to write about Florida, um, but I was kind of scarred, and I also just wasn't sure how. All of my work is autobiographical, <laughs> even the festival of the freshwater squid to some degree. And most details are firsthand in my novels, especially the ones that have to do with, with nature and animals. So to not write about Florida, which I've, you know, I've lived there since the 80s, just seemed impossible over time. And so eventually I did. Uh, this was actually from a, a photo shoot. The publisher wanted me to drown the book in a tidal pool, and it turns out that Annihilation uh, floats. Uh, so I had to do this instead, um, although I also was told off by a park ranger because I did it in a national park in uh, California by mistake. Anyway, so <laughs> um, when it did happen, I didn't realize just how surreal things would get, and, and I felt like the freshwater squid incident was surreal enough and that nothing could really top it. And I didn't realize, though, that there would be a movie, um, and a very strange movie and a strange process, for example and that that would create another blurring of reality and not reality. And so before I talk a little bit about the book, I want to give you a preview of how weird it got later with the movie. So my first experience of the finished movie, because <laughs> I hadn't seen a, a cut at this point, was these two dude bros, and there is a link there to a YouTube video that's still up there, having seen a first glimpse of the first 10 minutes of it, uh, at a Comic-Con, and I still hadn't seen it, right? So <laughs> I <laughs> had to listen to them go on, and they had not read the book, and they apparently did not know what Google was, so they did not know anything else about the movie or my book. So I call this footage, two dudes explain my book to me without knowing anything about it, um, or two dudes don't know how to use Google, or oh my god, there are trees, amazeballs, because at one point they ran out of things to say, and one of them said to the other in this gushing fake ecstasy, and there were trees, there were so many trees. <laughs> Remember, I haven't seen the movie, I haven't seen any footage, and I'm trying to parse from their description what this movie is actually like. And they finally decided that this is what my book was about and the movie was about. They decided all the men are dead, like everywhere but there must be some men in Area X, like some last men, and all the women are going to find the last men in Area X. <laughs> Which is actually kind of antithetical to the point of the book. <laughs> um, so I was very concerned at this point about what the movie might contain or not contain. Um, and then there were ridiculous things like, I admire the, the hell out of this article. At a certain point, <laughs> at a certain point, people ran out of things to say and takes to have. And so this poor dude, probably like four in the afternoon, probably was tasked with pulling another annihilation article out of his ass, and this was it. 
And it was amazing. He was mapping different creatures in the movie to different Pokemon. And it actually kind of made sense. Like, as somebody who has been under deadline and had to write nonfiction on the fly, I was deeply appreciative, even as it was complete nonsense, but got shared 500 million times. And then there was the sheer disconnect of the scale, right? So you'd have something really serious, and then you'd have something really just not so serious. So for example, on the same day that people were, were saying that Barack Obama's portrait looked like he had been inserted into Area X, there was a gym offering to, quote, annihilate your quads, along with a chance to win tickets to the Annihilation movie. <laughs> This was all very destabilizing for me, as somebody who was trying to write about Florida wilderness. Um, and then, this is a really terrifying photo, as far as I'm concerned. And then comes the premiere, and you're walking down the red carpet, and it's incredibly bizarre, and a bit like being in a crowded mall too long. And one lone guy among all the fans thronging behind the sidewalk fences, shouting out their love for Tessa Thompson, yells out, love your work too, Jeff. <laughs> And you wind up being photographed with Tessa Thompson, and it is one of the most terrifying moments of your entire life for a variety of reasons, one of which may be evident. Um, <laughs> but, you know, again, the book had nothing to do with any of this spectacle. I swear <laughs> that it is based on the hiking I do uh, out at St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. And the novel begins in a tone completely unlike everything you've seen, which is, the tower, which was not supposed to be there, plunges into the earth in a place just before the black pine forest begins to give way to swamp, and then the reeds and wind-gnarled trees of the marsh flats. Beyond the marsh flats and the natural canals lies the ocean, and a little farther down the coast, a derelict lighthouse. All of this part of the country had been abandoned for decades for reasons that are not easy to relate. Our expedition was the first to enter Area X for more than two years. Staring out over that untroubled landscape, I do not believe any of us could see the threat. So basically an expedition into a strange wilderness where weird things are happening, just like life these days. I wrote it after having had all my wisdom teeth pulled at a root canal at the same time, and I often recommend to beginning writers that dental surgery is their best bet for writing a national bestseller. Um, I was out of my mind on painkillers, and I don't remember writing large parts of it. Uh, <laughs> which sounds like something that you say after you're picked up on a DUI, but um, nonetheless, what my writing process was. <laughs> and yes, um, it had uncanny elements, but it was also a love letter to wild Florida. And yes, it had alligators in it. I had the choice of several different creatures. I've been charged by a wild boar, which is something you can legitimately put in a dramatic novel. Um, and then also I've seen dolphins in a freshwater canal, which is very surreal because you don't really understand what you're seeing in the water at first because you don't expect to see it there. Kind of like when I was in Australia and there was a flash of brown and when it leapt out, my brain was frozen for like two seconds because it wasn't a deer, it was a kangaroo. <laughs> So it's kind of like that. And then also I was once, my wife and I were charged by an otter. And um, my wife was saying, oh, look at the cute otter. It just wants to say hi. And I was like, run like hell. <laughs> and uh, the reason is that an otter coming towards you is just one huge, massive muscle um, that can really tear up your leg. And any zookeeper will tell you that they can get really nasty. So, but the optics of that, of, of two, two bipeds, uh, much larger than this small beast uh, running across <laughs> a marshland <laughs> pursued by an otter is something reserved purely for a comic novel. Um, although it is true that in Florida, I don't know about in Alabama, we call alligators uh, scaly basset hounds. Uh, this, is a, this is important later, Birmingham, so I just want you to remember that. So, so the book was uh, published in 35 languages. Um, and won awards and been very successful. It sold a ton of copies in the US. But it's also been transformed by contact with other minds, so to speak, with readers. And so long before there was a movie, the book began to become transformed. Um, and the process of creating narrative and story 
uh, from setting didn't stop with publication, nor did the novel always seem like the same novel, depending, like literally, this could be like a local website that just didn't have a budget for anything. Um, so, uh, and also I would note that the weird Thoreau is actually Thoreau, um, not me, so. So to this day, and I, at first it was very destabilizing because I was like asking the publisher, is the book doing well? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, why are there so many one-star reviews on Amazon? And then gradually over time, uh, I learned to just go with the wave of this, which is on the Southern Reach trilogy, it's one star, five star, one star, five star, one star, five star, all the way down. And that seems to be my career at this point. Um, things also that I found very strange, like you're doing it wrong. Someone, some one reader was like, you're doing it wrong. And I'm like, what is it I'm doing in the first place? Please tell me. I was actually half unconscious when I wrote it. Um, another science fiction writer um, in a tweet, <laughs> called me a Drek merchant because <laughs> he said the science was wrong. It was very strange. Boring, exciting, stupid, smart. <laughs> I got all of the different reactions in the same year that on a busted knee I was doing a six-month book tour because all three books came out in the same year. And as they began to do better and better, I was kept out in the field longer and longer. Um, but the most favorite review I ever got was from an erotic hypnosis website. Now there is hypnosis in the books, but anyway. So Annihilation, they gave five stars. Annihilation is apparently the perfect erotic hypnosis novel of all time. Authority, one star. The worst hypnotic, erotic, erotic hypnotic, <laughs> hypnosis, hypnosis novel of all time. Um, and I actually kind of wanted to contact them about what their criteria were, um, but I was also very, very, very afraid. So I did not. <laughs> so another thing is the first encounters with other interpretations of this trilogy came through the different covers, even more than the reviews. Like every country did something radically different. So the book kind of became something different. Are these even the same books across the covers I'm about to show you? And I wonder how the art mutated the experience for the reader, contaminating it in useful or unuseful ways. And then I also ask you, Birmingham, uh, how did it help the Spanish edition to be compared by the publisher to Fifty Shades of Grey? Because <laughs> that happened too. <laughs> and it didn't. The book tanked in that market <laughs> for the obvious reasons. So these are two editions of authority. The one on the right is the Ukrainian edition. And the right on the left, the one on the left is the Hungarian one. The Hungarian one is hilarious to me because that little dot of rabbit eye is all that's on the next page because that's a cutout. It's kind of a weird, weird thing. And then the poles went with this non-erotic hypnosis illusion um, in a graphic style that's apparently very popular there. The Italian covers are so delicate in contrast to the crudeness of the contents. And then some of these acts of creation post-publication uh, came from the publisher, like the map of Area X that was used online. And this is the actual coastline of Florida, but it also now exists in the realm of fiction as something else. There are people who only know this real coastline as a kind of ghost line, a way of gleaning clues about Area X. And I participated gleefully in this process myself. As with this diagram, I actually commissioned for the second novel authority to make one of the more absurdist and horrifying moments in the novel visual. There is also in the novel, and I'm very proud of this, although I don't have a visual, uh, of a character washing a mouse and talking to it. And I'm fairly sure that this is unique in literature, uh, maybe may the only mouse washing scene of its kind. Uh, and so we did also create a mouse washing detergent uh, Whitby mouse washing detergent. Some of you may be familiar with that name. Um, but then we had to issue a disclaimer because it turns out that if you wash your mouse too vigorously, you can give it respiratory diseases. Uh, so we had to discontinue that product line. And then at a certain point, many years later, when you're kind of beginning to just kind of become meta, uh, we actually got together to create on April Fool's Day, children's editions of the Southern Reach. And this backfired. Uh, spectacularly because everyone wanted them and thought they were real and we had to backtrack and we had to apologize to a lot of people on Twitter uh, in a way that didn't get me ratioed, thankfully. So, You might even, um, out on tour, continue the narrative by posing with the animal characters in your novels. Um, you might reconsider that when 
The same owl that you posed with a few minutes before is standing out to the side of the stage with a handler as you begin your reading and begins to just shit copiously over the entire <laughs> stage in a projectile way. And the visual that you're getting is, and you're not getting this tonight, thankfully. I, I had the opportunity to bring an owl here, and I, I spared you that. Um, me reading while this is being cleaned up, um, which kind of set the wrong tone. Also, colleges love this image, and I spent a season as this photo doing university gigs where people thought it must be the German nihilist. So, <laughs> it really, in a certain context, is kind of off putting. <laughs> Here's the Christo fascist with his owl. <laughs> um, and then sometimes a friend's rabbits might gather unexpectedly for a photo op because you're hiding rabbit food near your person. Um, <laughs> it's still cute, though. <laughs> I sold some books. Um, you might even dress up as a lighthouse as you're on the book tour, and your publisher, <laughs> your publisher, is kind of like cracking the whip, saying, "You need to do more. You need to do different things. We've tried all these things. People are getting sick of it." Um, and you're a little giddy from being on the month uh, on the road, like I said, from month five with a busted knee. And be, perhaps because of your own willingness to engage in imaginative play, other people join in with fan art, professional art, whatever you want to call it. And there's a glorious aspect of things getting muddled and confused in lovely ways. Because both of these images, for example, have inspired me in other fictional works. And it's gotten hard to know where the lines are, but in a kind of playful and useful way. People even created a whole series of found objects from the Area X books, sometimes repurposing things like the map that I showed you earlier, or depicting an epic scene from one of the novels. Please look away if you haven't read Acceptance. This is your punishment for not already reading Acceptance. Um, tattoos, lots of tattoos of rabbits, very cool tattoos. Words from the novel on a mu musician's distortion pedal. Fake cover for a graphic novel that I actually wish existed. And then this next one is really hilarious to me. Um, a Marxist group plastered this for the total annihilation of capital in major Australian cities. Like I was getting reports from people that I hardly knew about, hey, did you see that this was here, that, and the other? So my question here in terms of the fiction versus the nonfiction is, did anyone understand the context or just get the gist? Uh, who saw this and did the people who did it, did they do it because they thought my novel was Marxist or because it was popular at that moment and they were trying to latch onto it, which seems rather odd for Marxists, but who knows? Um, but I love the idea that there were people who saw this had no idea what it, what it really meant. And then there were fan art corrections uh, to the changes from book to movie and also very interesting tower tunnel depictions. Someone might even write the words from the tower tunnel on a platform next to the very lighthouse that inspired your novel. And what's hilarious about this is when I posted this, people accused me <laughs> of writing it myself to take the photograph. And it's like, I didn't have time to sit there and write this. Um, and it was flattering, but I also have to say it was very startling. Like I actually got a sense of how these words have power for a reader and counting them the first time because it felt like an incantation with a possible unexpected consequence in a context where I hadn't expected to see it. Sidewalk art, someone <laughs> sent me this. Um, and I love this one to death for the same reason as some of the other stuff. Folks who pass this by not knowing what in the hell they were looking at or what it was from <laughs> until the rains washed it away. <laughs> Our local brewery actually tried to do a <laughs> beer from muscadine grapes, of all things. And uh, I'm not kidding when I say that a strange fungus got into the batch <laughs> and destroyed it. <laughs> So there's only this pairing, and there have been various pairings over the years. A linguist might even create an alphabet using living letters partially based on the book. Um, yeah, this is like actually fairly off-putting to me. <laughs> As someone who, who gets nauseous just from gifts in general. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's gross. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that. Um, but what if you don't care about living alphabets? Is there fan fiction about annihilation? Um, and in actual fact, there is. There is fan fiction from someone who combined true detective and annihilation. And what it is, is I'm not kidding, and I don't know if it's still up, but it was hundreds and hundreds of pages of rust from true detective and the biologists going down deeper and deeper and deeper into the tower tunnel 
with the biologist taking the piss out of the out of Rust and his nihilistic theories the entire way down. It was kind of glorious. It kind of solved some problems in True Detective, and it kind of solved some problems in Annihilation. Um, but I was afraid to comment <laughs> because I was afraid that if they knew I was watching, that that might block them or something. So I would really like someday to be able to tell them that how much I enjoyed it. Um, but that also transformed how I thought about the biologist to some degree, and and how I write characters since. And then how things changed, book to film, uh, the most radical shift. Um, and just another example of absurdity. This is a, a, an image of, well, obviously, of a sea anemone photoshopped into a photo of me hiking at Morro Bay in California. And um, I posted it as a joke. And a actual legitimate film site posted it on Twitter saying, is this a still from the Annihilation movie to try to get clicks? <laughs> And I will tell you, no, no. I'm a terrible actor. My son is a casting director in Hollywood, and he can't even get me a, a role as a tree in the background of something. So. so yeah, so weird director seeks annihilation in a dream of a book. As Alex Garland has said, he read the book and then decided to do a movie that was like a dream of the book, which is kind of weird to me because you know I kind of wrote it from a dream of the book. <laughs> so it's not the dream of a dream. So he'd say things like, mind if I put the tower tunnel under the lighthouse instead of it being separate? And I'd say, um, I'm not sure about that. And he'd say, great, we'll do it. <laughs> and that's, that's kind of the level of control I had. Um, and then he just kind of went off and did his thing. Can I get a, I blame Alex Garland? No? <laughs> oh, wow. He's very powerful. Um, <laughs> So once again, <laughs> once again, the novel changed. So it became very meta for me, just as somebody who is <laughs> already employing meta devices in many of my novels, because I was doing a site visit, and I was doing a site visit to a place called Area X, because that's how they were disguising where the site was. <laughs> so everything was described as Area X something, Area X Cantina, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was to basically keep the press out. And then the lovely thing was that at this base camp, they did have images they collected to create a uh, identifying look and feel. What is the visual story that the, the movie will tell? And there were hundreds of these in story order in Pinewood Studio uh, taped to the wall. And somehow seeing that progression, and sometimes it was just color progressions, was actually kind of useful in, in future novels for me. Uh, for example, when they were coming up with the shimmer, they were looking at real uh, cloud formations uh, and trying to figure out how to translate that into, I guess, the oily stuff that you see on the pavement near a gas station. Um, and of course, lighthouses and the textures that might be applied to lighthouses. And then definite art created to begin to map out what we may, might be made for uh, the movie itself. And so the bear in the movie, <laughs> Alex Garland told me, was the boar plus the moaning creature. And he told me this. I said, well, why can't we have the moaning creature? I really, I really, I really like the the moaning creature, and if there's a third movie, you might even find out what it is. And he says, well, Jeff, I don't believe in the uncanny. And I said, well, in a few years, you're going to make a movie about the uncanny called Men, so I don't understand that. Um, but anyway, so, uh, so he said he didn't really believe in the uncanny, so he couldn't keep my moaning creature, and he wanted to turn it into a bear. And then I said, well, bears don't usually follow people around a landscape. Boars do. And this was, this was the mode I was in because I was in this nature mode, and it didn't really make any sense in movie terms. This was the point at which you fire the consultant um, because they're being way too pedantic about their favorite topic. Um, although I would note that Garland had no problem having a logical scientist ask if a shark could mate with an alligator in the finished movie. Um, more conceptual art of the bear. And then what cracked me up is again this lack of context. So <laughs> Someone sent me these photos, which are actually on some kind of geocache site in the UK. They weren't actually from the movie, um, where people were seeing this sign that said, Annihilation, no parking, no entry. And they had no idea what it meant again <laughs> while they were trying to hike in some British forest. Um, and then you know, things like this were pretty hilarious to me. So Pinewood Studios had its own on-site build of a lighthouse. But they also had to build on the beach for the final scenes in the movie. And this was all a series of kind of odd echoes for me, because there's a real lighthouse that I base my lighthouse on. Then instead of shooting at that lighthouse, 
the movie makes its own lighthouse. Meanwhile, in book three of my trilogy, a secret government base has built a replica of the lighthouse for training purposes. So at some point, I have absolutely no idea what lighthouse I'm looking at. Um, and I feel like it could have been useful to me before I wrote the book to have seen some of these images. Um, and yes, they did have an alligator, so they wouldn't rely on CGI. Um, I did tell Alex Garland in my pedantic mode that no one had ever made a good movie with an albino alligator in it. And he said, well, Jeff, we will make the first one. <laughs> and then some things delighted me because the real weird is weirder than the unreal. So on the left is some of the fungus and lichen that's from the movie. On the right is something from my backyard. Um, and so it's a testimony to the real world that sometimes the human imagination is inadequate because there's much as strange uh, lichen and moss formations out in North Florida as some of the stuff uh, in the movie. Uh, not to mention our mailbox. Uh, we'll seriously not mention it. If you're in Florida, uh, well, maybe here too, you, you just don't even recognize that your mailbox is all effed up after a while. <laughs> and of course, there are people in the movie, not just plants. Um, and those same people wandering around the set as themselves. So there was a surreal moment of having been to the set and then seeing the actors going around the set. And then, you know, when I met them, I met the full expedition of all five of them. They were at the far end of uh, Pinewood Studios, uh, a room in there. And they all turned at the same time and started walking towards me. And there were two things that bothered me. One, they were all the exact same height. I'm not kidding. They were like all five, three. But in my mind, they were like seven feet tall. So as they approached, I expected them to get much larger and they stayed five, three. Um, but they were all extremely kind. Um, you could tell where they were in their careers because someone like Natalie Portman or Jennifer Jason Lee, you know, they've been around the block a bit in terms of the number of movies they've made. And I think that, you know, they need to have a certain kind of distance, whereas for um, Tessa Thompson and for uh, Gina Rodriguez, it was kind of a new thing that they were really just kind of overly bubbly and joyful about, and so they were willing to kind of talk for a while. Um, the other thing that was kind of hilarious is that the Star Wars movie was shooting at the same time uh, on Pinewood Studios, the one that Oscar Isaac was in, and that's how they were able to get Isaac for Annihilation. And so he would sneak over and do his scenes for Annihilation, then go back. But the Annihilation prop people would go and sneak over to the Star Wars scenes uh, and steal uh, vines and things because they didn't have quite enough budget. Uh, so there are vines from Star Wars that are actually also in, in Annihilation. And then there was this incredible emotional moment because they were filming uh, two, two kind of deaths or disappearances of characters in the movie. Uh, one of them was Tessa Thompson's, and they had all bonded so much that the deaths were very emotional. So there was this very emotional scene of shooting it. And then there was the emotional scene of them immediately like saying goodbye to each other and hopping on a plane <laughs> to do something else. Uh, so it was very intense uh, for uh, more so than I thought it would be. As intense uh, was the beach shooting because they prepped it for the CGI in such a way that they didn't tell the people looking over the beach, including one of the bed and breakfasts. So on social media and on their website for like half a day, there was all this stuff about, oh my God, there are these corpses all over the beach. They must have floated in from whatever. Um, and then they were, of course, quite happy that it was a film shoot. And by midday, they had changed their website and say, you know, stay at our bed and breakfast and see Annihilation being shoot and see, see all these corpses on the beach. Um, and the last scenes in the movie are more surreal than actually the, the novel to some degree. And they create an alternate reality in which the book and the movie blur and parts of both kind of lodge together in the reader's minds. And so I don't necessarily think when someone comes up to me and they have a memory of some surreal bit that turns out to be from the movie that they've necessarily not read the book. Um, but I think that they're so different that sometimes they do actually communicate with one another in a way that they wouldn't uh, otherwise. But then there's also this strange thing. Again, you write about a backpack for an expedition, <laughs> and then one day you're sent one in the mail that's a facsimile from the set. Um, and it winds up in your doorstep, and, and at some point, you know, you're fabulously lucky to have this all happening, but you're also kind of um, finding it peculiar and baffling to the imagination. It begins to kind of um, impose itself on your subconscious. You know, the things that meant one thing in your head are physically in your face as something else. Um, then there are the hard questions you have to ask yourself. Um, like when Tessa Thompson 
tweeted this image. Do I DM her because she friended me or do I just sit here and kind of shriek at the possibility that I can DM her? <laughs> and in the end I didn't, but she did actually DM me and I felt like every word in response was revealing me to be a complete um, and then you see the movie. We saw the movie in LA on the Paramount lots. It was a rough cut. We had a nice uh, conversation with executives who would all be fired in the next month, although we did not know that, about how I was the future of cinema. I didn't bring this up. Uh, they did. <laughs> and just how amazing and lucky they were <laughs> before they were fired to be in conversation with me. Uh, and then you sit there and you watch the rough cut, and the rough cut doesn't have music. It doesn't have all the things voiced that it should have voiced. And you've already been to the set and you already have the book in your head. Uh, and it's just an extremely bizarre experience. I, I was saying to someone earlier that I'm an unreliable witness for the movie and the reality of the movie for that very reason. But then the other thing is you come out of that and you expect the executives to still be there. And I don't know if it was the time of day or what, but there was no one there. There was not a single solitary soul on the floor of the building for us to talk to or to give our reaction to. And I don't know if that's something that they planned or not. Um, and so, for example, in the rough cut, the um, Portman uh, mimic scene is probably a third longer and has no music behind it. And so it reads more like kind of a weird mime scene and it, it it's good that it's shorter and has the music because without it, it's actually kind of hilarious at the longer length because it's that thing where something's awkward, right? And when it's awkward, you have the ability to laugh at it or kind of recoil from it. And so it was interesting to watch it without music because for a while it's, it's really disturbing and then it's really funny, then it's disturbing again, then it's funny again, then it's disturbing. Um, and you have to literally cut it in such a way and use the music so that it winds up disturbing and not funny. <laughs> Um, and then the movie was more accurate to the book in some ways than people thought. Like, for example, at the end, that was Alice Garland's attempt to make a tower tunnel. Uh, the problem was executives at Paramount told him that no one would be interested in words on a wall. <laughs> so it couldn't have words on a wall. And then the bear in the rough cut was not voiced uh, by the actress, as I recall. It was just by some bored guy. So it was just like, help me, help me. Um, which did not add to the ambiance of that particular scene. So at the end of the day, though, you know, my novel and its influences still exist apart from the movie. And North Florida exists as well. But the bear in the movie did bring up another question <laughs> and another kind of contamination, which is what the heck is moored from my <laughs> book born doing an annihilation the movie and I actually got this question from a lot of fans are like when you were writing the screenplay which I didn't do um, did you decide to just combine these universes <laughs> um, and so it was this other weird disconnect where I was out on tour for born and being asked questions about annihilation because of it um, and so things that you learn from all these transformations uh, you know, first of all, that fiction once out in the world takes on its own reality and sometimes aggressively. And although you kind of know this as a writer, and I even say that to beginning writers at workshops, until you actually kind of live in it, you don't really understand how <laughs> aggressively or strange that can get or how meta. And if you're lucky, readers will playfully extend and change your fiction, but only if you also give them permission to. So, you know, whenever all this fan art came out, I was always extremely supportive of it, retweeting it and everything else. And so that just generated more. And that created kind of an interesting feedback uh, effect because that then informed future fiction, not in a direct influence way, but something about the playfulness and some of the imagery. And sometimes I actually wound up using those artists for future projects. And then, for example, because of readers and the movie, frankly, there may soon be a Southern Reach environmental residency, and I may become the director of a real Southern Reach organization, <laughs> which is a little scary. Um, and I also learned that narratives, that stories do enter the real world, and the unreality of the movie made it possible for my novels to not just address environmental concerns, but also embody them in the sense of literary criticism, scientific papers even, um, being able to be in communication with scientists, and so the whole process, you know, and also quite frankly, the movie allowed me to be more active in the environmental space in a way that I hadn't realized would occur. Um, 
And I also learned that while creative play and having a movie are great, they can change the writers. Oh goodness, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening there. <laughs> well, just imagine that that is um, some born books and I'm just gonna put that up there because it's cuter. Um, so, you know, literally how you relate to your own work. Um, and I remember that the first time this happened to me was on uh, the second book in the Ambergris series, Shriek, because I'd had books out from small presses and Shriek was the first one out from a major publisher. And suddenly I was getting a ton of reader feedback and that was actually mostly good, but I, it was like a torrent in the back of your mind. So if you can imagine with the movie, this torrent becoming just this flood, and then there's so many articles that are so inaccurate about so many things, and that's also kind of messing with your brain. Um, so the scrutiny because of the movie made me scared of kind of losing my way, uh, and losing my way with my muse and maybe something affecting my writing. And so the next novel I wrote, Dead Astronauts, was deliberately the most experimental idea that I had. And to kind of reset and inoculate myself after all of the kind of commercial business surrounding the movie, um, a sequel to Born that is even more surreal uh, than the end of Annihilation. And then in a kind of great feedback loop, all of the creative plays surrounding these books and environmental writing about my books has made me even more aware of biodiversity and ecological issues to the point that I jokingly cosplay as a baby raccoon on, on social media. Um, people don't remember this, but uh, at the beginning of the pandemic as a joke, because I just thought it would be amusing for people, I, at ground level, took videos where I pretended to be different animals, which I also narrated using different like pathways and things like that. Um, so it wasn't that far to go. In fact, I'm very proud of the fact that I haven't fallen any further than cosplaying a baby raccoon in three years. Um, but I have spent the past three years rewilding our yard for wildlife and butterflies and birds. And in a sense, part of that is because the imagination and approval of readers and the amplification of things like the movie have turned my life into one of my novels. And it is an interesting thing to feel like you're both fiction and nonfiction at the same time. There is over time no separation between the two for me. And oddly enough, Birmingham, in my case at least, that does not feel like a terribly bad thing. So um, that is what I have for you. Because I have not given a... And I apologize, my, my voice be is beginning to give out just a little bit because I haven't actually done anything like this for three years. That, by the way, is an interesting story I'll tell you extremely briefly. Uh, there's a festival in Sardinia called the Isle of Stories. Um, and you get sequestered in this little village uh, and you see all these, these life-size black and white portraits of people along the walls and you think it's in memoriam. And then they have you take a, a photo with a huge pot of geraniums or whatever they are. Uh, and the next year you see photos of your face, life-size in windows um, <laughs> in this small Sardinian town. So it turns out that the next year's uh, participants get to see the prior participants on the walls or in the windows. Um, and so I didn't know <laughs> when I was having this picture taken how it would be used, but I, I find it kind of, kind of hilarious because it's also a really large pot of flowers. <laughs> anyway. Questions, concerns, issues. The concerns and issues must still be in the form of a question, I must say. Yeah, if you would like to come ask Jeff Vandermeer a question, please start forming a line right over here. And if you don't come right away, you can come up whenever you want. Don't be shy. I mean, I will take a shouted question if everyone can hear it, but no, you want the process, I just. <laughs> hey, Jeff. Big hey. Fans. Oh, thanks. Um, so, apart from painkillers and root canals, can you talk a little bit about your process, <laughs> writing, research, and otherwise? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, <laughs> with regard to research, what I really like to do is research uh, many years before I have to write something. Generally, what happens is I'll get eight or nine ideas at once for a novel, and then usually most of them will take the better part of a decade to kind of finish. So I usually have a lot of time. It's not usually like Annihilation where I just, uh, just comes out that spontaneously. Um, so for example, I knew I was gonna eventually redo uh, a, uh, a fantasy mystery, Finch. Uh, and so I took a job with Publishers Weekly doing reviews of thrillers and mysteries because that way I was just like basically getting everything and not being able to choose what I read and kind of steep myself in all of that kind of uh, uh, whatnot. So by the time I became, uh, wrote Finch, I already had that research done and it was in the back of my brain. And I'm a big believer in 
if you do it that way, if there's stuff I don't remember, probably the reader isn't that interested in it either. So I don't really go back. Um, what I will do is like a hummingbird salamander, which I haven't talked about much. Um, and also just because I'm lazy, after I finish the novel, I'll give it to an expert. So like I gave it to a wildlife trafficking expert, a journalist, and, uh, and, and he told me, well, actually, Jeff, it could be anyway because criminal syndicates that do this don't have a business model. They don't have a business school for this. So any, anything's possible. Um, so, but, but, but basically, I will do that for a very specific thing. Um, sometimes lately, I, I'm so lazy that I actually ask a biologist to write part of the novel. So in Hummingbird Salamander, the salamander description and the hummingbird description are both by a biologist who's an expert in those things. And uh, it worked out great because there are in-jokes about Latin names and things that I would never have thought of in the first place. Um, and in, in having to react to that material was much better than having to research and make up my own fake fake bird and fake salamander. So that's kind of some of the ways that I do it. Right now I'm, I'm studying weird architecture for a seven novel series uh, that I'm very excited about, um, about a very strange architect in a strange house. Hey there. Hi. Um, so from your early books in Ambergris mm -hmm. all the way to the modern books, um, your novels tend to have an element of sort of eldritch horror to them. <laughs> and I've just always been curious, how do you, what's the key to doing that? You uh, have like a verisimilitude to it yeah. that is just compulsively readable. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I joke about, and it's true that, that I wrote Annihilation under, the, under those conditions, but I'd also been involved with my wife in, in researching and putting together this anthology called The Weird a few years before. Uh, which is 850,000 words. It was supposed to be 500,000, but we lied to the publisher and luckily didn't notice it till it was laid out. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, when you do that, and even the stuff you discard, and when you have to put it together as quickly as we did, um, it's so intense and it's taking up your life in such a way that my theory is Annihilation in that series was very much influenced by this, this kind of strata in my subconscious of all these stories that just jumbled together. Uh, in such a way. Um, other than that, it's just that I, I do, did study, you know, as you can tell, weird biology for a long time. And I was, I gravitated to squid and to fungi because I really thought that they were otherworldly. They, their life cycles were so unlike ours. I thought it was fertile territory for fantasy and science fiction and for exploration. Um, and one thing I'm really kind of proud of is there's a lot of extrapolation about fungal technology in the Ambergris books that now is stuff that people are actually developing to some degree. Um, even though back then I can remember one science fiction writer saying that this is crackpot marginalized stuff. You need to write about something real. <laughs> and he might've been right, but I think he was probably wrong. Um, I'm not sure how otherwise though. I just take weird moments in nature too and kind of amplify them. And please come up. Um, if you are concerned about being on camera, don't worry, the camera is not pointed at you. If you want to be on camera, I can't help you. Uh, but I will ask a question while we have people come back up or just real quick. Um, can you remember what book it was for you as a reader that really made you decide that this is what you want to do with your career or your life or passion? Um, I don't know if it was a book. I started writing when I was in Fiji at a very young age. I think I was six or seven. And my parents had the habit of reading to me weird stuff. Like they would read William Blake to me and things like that. And so I had these kind of fiery visions in my head um, along with this tropical paradise. And uh, I just remember not writing because of a book, um, but to kind of work out an existential condition, which was twofold. One, I was in this tropical paradise, but I had these terrible allergies and asthma. So I had this kind of veil of weird suffering over and yet living in this paradise. And then my parents were going through this 10 year divorce that was just absolutely awful. And so I began writing to kind of like both escape that and kind of make sense of it. Um, and also kind of make sense of the fact that I was living in overseas places, but not actually like a citizen of them. So I didn't feel comfortable writing about them directly because even living there as a kid, I kind of got the sense that that was kind of weird. Um, so I started writing fantasy places that incorporated elements of our travels overseas. So I don't think it was really book related so much is that, you know, because they read to me, I understood and valued the world of books. Um, I was just curious, you know, as a Florida writer, yeah. I mean, we also know like 
Carl Hyacin, I'm thinking of, also <laughs> writes yeah. very much about the <laughs> environment and the ecological impact yeah. um, in Florida. And um, I was just wondering, sort of, what is your personal feeling? Do you feel optimistic mm -hmm. <laughs> about um, sort of climate change and the changes mm. taking place in Florida? Yeah. Or how do you feel personally about that? Um, I, I just really want to nail down the facts, so to speak, which is to say I'm not really hopeful or not hopeful. It's just that you can't really have effective policy and action if you're not dealing with the right set of facts. And so, you know, I wrote a, a long article about Florida's situation for current affairs in part to kind of nail down the facts to kind of like record what's actually happening because right now, for example, and this does affect uh, climate crisis, but also just environmentally in general, uh, you know, you have big developers now co-opting the term YIMBY to just basically try to get huge, terrible developments passed and, and try to shame environmentalists into to being quiet, even though it's not actually a NIMBY situation. And so you see the weaponization of a lot of terms. Uh, you see a lot of sprawl that shouldn't be happening. Um, I'm, I, I was very hopeful in the sense that one thing I was writing about, these destructive toll roads that would have really, you know, once the toll roads go in, they're basically there through rural, rural areas of Florida so that developers can then bring sprawl to those areas. Um, that's really why they want the roads and infrastructure in. And so recently, it was really quite awe-inspiring to see all these people get together um, who may have absolutely nothing else in common politically or anything else to basically defeat these toll roads. And so I thought that was kind of an eye-opening moment and a hopeful moment because they've carried that through politically to the point that you have people who are very conservative voting for Democrats in some of those counties simply on the toll road vote. So, I mean, I'm not sure how hopeful that is, but that that was definitely a, an activism thing where it looked for sure they were just going to basically destroy, you know, large parts of the last wilderness of Florida, and they haven't. So. So, uh, what I wanted to ask about is, um, so moving from like the Amberger series, <coughs> this very like urbanized setting to the pristine wilderness of annihilation and yeah. then to uh, born, which is, you know, yeah. nature existing kind of on yeah. the fringes of these urban landscapes. Uh, what has inspired you to focus on one side of that or another over time, like go from mm -hmm. this urban landscape to, yeah, yeah and so on? Um, well, one thing I just want to add, by the way, is that for some reason you can't come up and you want to ask a question, please raise your hand from your seat and I'm happy to take a question from your chair. Um, uh, with regard to the urban versus wilderness settings, uh, I think that the urban stuff was really in part because I was a huge student of historical theory in college, and I became fascinated by all these crackpot historians. And, and some of them were crackpots who then got huge followings, and for decades their, their, their teachings were considered to be completely <laughs> valid and then eventually they discovered well that's really just based on nothing um, and so that really fascinated me because that's an area that's rife for fiction really really what we're talking about is someone that thinks they're projecting fact and they're actually writing fiction and that's fascinating uh, and then also reconciling you know a lot of the world travel that we did was to huge amazing cities like Calcutta uh, uh, Mumbai and um, and New Delhi and uh, uh, you know places in Egypt and uh, places in, the, in, in, in Southeast Asia. And uh, again, I didn't, I didn't really feel, as a writer, I didn't really feel comfortable and I also didn't really have the vision to, to write about those places directly. And so they kind of all come together in this historical context in the Ambergris stories. And then once I moved to Florida, I just fell in love with the wilderness and became more enamored of it. And I'm always very reactive to the place I'm in. Um, and I always want the details in my books to be firsthand if, if, at all possible. And so that's, that's definitely one, one reason. So. Can you come in on the artwork? Yeah. What was artwork that did yeah. your narrative? Uh, I'm, my mother is a painter and uh, I, I grew up with a studio and then with my dad's science lab, he studies fire ants and stuff. And uh, so I'm very particular about the art and uh, often I will reach out to particular artists to create a look and feel. And uh, even on the book covers, I have, I have final approval and everything. So, uh, you know, often with the publishers lately, I haven't had to, to make any notes because they come up with these amazing ideas. But, but, uh, but I, I do try to, I do. So thank you for, for recognizing that. 
Like, can you talk a little about the sort of the nuts and bolts of how you write from day to day? Do you write yeah. longhand? Do you type <laughs> into a computer? Do you keep notes and ideas and computer mm -hmm. files or sticky notes? Yeah. That sort of uh, Nabokov had this amazing, I think, really great method, which is he had uh, little note cards. Uh, and he would write uh, one fragment as it came to him on each note card, and then he was able to put those in sequential form. And so I thought that was a great idea. Uh, I sometimes run out of note cards, but I have learned which leaves when I'm hiking uh, hold up to ink and, and being in my pocket. Um, but I do the same thing. I reward myself subconscious by every single thing that comes up, whether it seems foolish or not, writing it down. And that just seems to continue to create a torrent of ideas. Uh, and then I do do it one per slip of paper. And that, again, helps a lot with sequencing. It seems like a small thing, but if you're just like typing into the same document or same page, then you have to kind of separate it all out later. So it saves me a step and I'm fundamentally lazy. So, um, and then as I've gotten more mature as a writer, I've learned that for me personally, I can always write a story too soon, but I can never write a story too late. So I often will write the fragments down and just let it steep and think about it and just keep letting it steep and be patient. And then at a certain point, I will take those slips of paper and write them up in sequential order. You know, little bits of scene description, character description. At a certain point when I'm working on a novel, it feels like the whole world uh, is kind of like I'm completely um, uh, receiving it. And so almost anything can be inspirational at a certain point. But I know that when I have about maybe 30,000 words of fragments and stuff, that it's probably about the time to start writing. And then what I do is I start writing in longhand. Um, I always write in longhand. It drives my dad, the scientist, up the wall because he feels like it should be an efficient process. But in writing, you're not trying to be efficient. You're trying to get to something better than you would otherwise if you were too hasty. And uh, so I write longhand. I try to get the voice of the character correct um, in the first few pages. I might rework the first 10 pages over and over again until I have the style, the cadence, the voice correct. And then I will go forward and write a rough draft in longhand. I'll type it into the computer. I will make notes on a, a printout. Then I will write it, rewrite it in longhand to kind of reimagine it again. And then I will type it up again. And it's kind of, it's a crude analogy, but it's like kneading dough and then breaking it down, building it up, breaking it down. Um, but I, what I found as I get even lazier is the longer I delay writing, the less writing I do. <laughs> um, so lately I'm doing fewer drafts, but they feel like they have the same depth. But I think it's just because I'm not writing as soon. You know, I just fundamentally, you know, not very productive. So thank you. This one sort of piggybacks on the mm -hmm. question about the Lovecraft, but. It was I about Eldritch Horror. Yes. Um, when reading Annihilation, there's an overwhelming sense of dread and unease that mm -hmm. for me was wonderfully oppressive. Mm -hmm. And if that is an atmosphere that you are purposefully trying to construct, what would you say is important to mm -hmm. helping create and uh, encourage that? I think it's a very um, particular to the situation. Um, in my particular case, uh, you know, I, I started out with an initial draft of Annihilation that the characters did not have names. They just had functions. And I was fairly sure of the influence of that was the story by Kafka in the penal colony. Uh, but I wasn't sure if I was going to keep it or not. <laughs> but every time that I started to assign names to them, I, and this, this does, does actually apply to your question, I felt like I knew less about them. So then I was asking myself, why am I just describing their, them by their function? And I was like, oh, I see. First of all, it's a paranoid thing because it's actually something about the secret agency that's sending them in that they're paranoid about because of other expeditions failing. Um, so it's like a psych thing. And then I was like, well, how does that affect the reader's reading of this? And I was like, well, if they don't have names and they don't have descriptions, then the wilderness is even more oppressive around them because literally they take up less space in description. And so part of that claustrophobic feel, I think, is conveyed by the fact that you know them just by what they say and what they do. And the biologist, of course, has such a fascination with nature that even though she's fascinated by it, it does become kind of overwhelmingly claustrophobic. Um, but then, you know, there's just little moments in life, like, you know, the most absurd one was <laughs> I once looked down a trail at St. Mark's and I thought for sure I saw a black kangaroo eating a rabbit, which could not have been what I saw. 
Um, <laughs> and I looked away for a second. When I looked back, it wasn't there. Um, but sometimes when you're out by yourself, um, you get these moments in solitude or in the sense of something watching you, which is usually like it was in San Diego, a mountain lion, um, or something else like that. Uh, you get a feeling, um, and then you just try to convey that feeling on the page. Um, but you know, I have also written a couple of essays about this. I think they're up on LitHub or Electric Literature, more specifically about hauntings, um, translations of things from film into uncanny film into fiction. So. Um, probably not the best answer, but what I've got right now. We have some? Yes, please. Oh, uh, this is a, yes. I love your writing. Oh, you know, thank you. How old is Neo? Is he like, <laughs> he seems like a pretty young cat. Neo is our cat. Uh, he's a, well, all you have to do is go to my Twitter feed if you don't already and you'll see him. Uh, he's 16 years old. Oh, wow. He's a 17 pound tuxedo cat. <laughs> Um, who at the corner of our eye looks like a small bear. Um, when he runs across the living room floor and we don't see him, it just sounds like a small horse is running across the thing. Um, but what I love about him is even though he's 16 and going on 17, he has not lost a step. Like he is exactly the same in all of his habits and all of his ways since he was 18 months and we got him. We got him in a yard sale of all things down the street. <laughs> Somebody had a sign out in the yard sale saying free cat. And we thought that does not sound right. And so we went and inside was Neo cowering in a corner. And these people were oblivious to us, the owners, debating whether to just throw him outside, declaw him. Um, and, and, and when we tried to take him, they said, well, he pees all over the place. Well, we don't care. We're taking this cat. <laughs> and so we took this cat, even though we already had three. And they said he was an old female cat. And, and we thought, great, we have one female cat and two male cats she hates. This will help balance things out. And we take him to the vet, and he's <laughs> a young male cat. And our female cat never, never, ever forgave us. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we, every day I look at him, I think he's such a miracle. Because what if we hadn't stopped? And, uh, and he, didn't, he didn't pee once once he was not afraid for his life. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks. One more? One or two more? Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. You, again, you don't have to come up here if you don't want to. You can yeah. speak from your chair. If you're shy or anything else. Yeah. Right. Just speak loudly, or I'll repeat the question. Yeah. Um, well, actually, a validation question first to make sure it even makes sense to ask the second question. Okay, a validation question. Uh, I think I read somewhere that the writing that was on the wall. Mm -hmm. That yeah. That. Yeah. Um, the writing on the wall in Annihilation. Um, I think it's actually about 12, 1,200 words. <laughs> um, yeah, it's the weirdest thing ever. It creeped me out because I don't usually remember words from dreams. Several of my novels have started as dreams, like the Ambergris series did. Um, and, and it's not so much that, that every dream becomes a novel. There's a lot of dreams that I have that are stupid, like Space Aardvarks blowing up our backyard did not become a novel. Um, but uh, with regard to that, yes, I, I had this weird dream while I was on these painkillers um, of walking down this tower tunnel and seeing these living words on the wall and realizing there was something below because I could see a light. Uh, and the reason it cuts off where it does in terms of the words is because that's where I cut off and decided that I was going to wake up rather than see whatever was making it. And I am still kind of... Um, certain that if I had seen what it was in my dream, I wouldn't have written a novel. Um, but it was very strange to me that I woke up from that dream immediately. I wrote those words, those very words down. Um, it never happened to me to, to see words and remember them from a dream. Very creepy. So, so what's your second question? Yeah, that's, I wanted to make one just a small line. It's just amazing because you're the one subconsciously writing it as you're reading. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, if you if you Google the first part, a few words of that on on Twitter, you will find that people are still using it in all kinds of hilarious contexts. I got a question right here to you, real quick. Yeah. Um, what is the weirdest question you've ever been asked, and can you answer it here now? What is the weirdest question I've ever been asked? Wow. Um, well, I get asked a lot of weird questions. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, not weird questions. Um, Oh, yeah, no, I remember one weird question. Um, <laughs> I was at a South Carolina book festival, and uh, this guy stood up, and he said, 
Well, that's all well and good, but when the cyborgs come and they just start annihilating all of the meat-based people, um, how is that going to play out? And um, he was completely serious. And I was like, well, well, it won't. Um, not all fiction is meant to last, and we tried to move on. Um, that's probably the weirdest thing. Um, I find weird, quite frankly, the rambling 10-minute non-question. That's what I find the weirdest. <laughs> and that's, so I appreciate you not having done that. So, yeah. um, I just want to ask about the, uh, I don't know, on social media, you talk about, and recently you talked about rewilding your yard yeah. a lot. Is there any particular resources, yeah. authors that you recommend mm -hmm. to consider that to kind mm -hmm. of get away from fields of watered grass right. that don't accomplish much for nature and to encourage people to kind of move in that direction of existing with nature versus right. trying to dominate it in our neighborhoods. Well, this guy named Talamy has uh, has a book out. I can't remember his first name now, but if you if you Google that, two L's, uh, you'll find his book about rewilding. What I would say is very, very site specific. So the best thing to do is to try to find a local wildflower society, a local native nursery. Usually uh, someone from those organizations would be willing to um, come out and do a kind of a walkthrough, you know, just to even just for 20 minutes to give you advice because it's very easy to do things that are actually harmful. Um, so I've walked through areas where someone's trying to, you know, promote pollinators, but in the process, they've gotten rid of the bramble that the rabbits and other things live in, right? So, you know, if you like rabbits, then, you know, that probably wasn't a good idea. Um, so you can, you can, there's a lot of preset things that I also had to work on where you have these foundational ideas kind of built in about what is a proper looking yard um, beyond just the lawn uh, that sometimes you have to kind of break. Uh, and one good way to do that, if you really care about wildlife, is to get a trail cam to see how wildlife's moving through your yard at night because even non-nocturnal wildlife tends to move through a yard at night because of human presence. And uh, once you see that, once you see, hey, this thing, the rabbits live in this bush over here, we'll just leave this for now, uh, or whatever, uh, then you get a better sense of how your yard's being used already. And then you can do that thing where you, you add and subtract from it. And you can do it slowly, and you can do it in one place. You can do it by not raking the leaves in part of your yard, which is incredibly important for like fireflies and stuff. So, um, But the local resources are best to get the, the best specific um, example for your yard and your topography. Right, we have time for one last question. So I'll be honest, I just pulled this off the shelf before coming and it's been a while since I've read it. Uh -huh. And I was reading the first uh -oh. page. And I remember when I read the line, um, I was the biologist, all of us were women this time, mm -hmm. looking back to the front to see was it a male or a female author and kind mm -hmm. of what, I'm curious what the story was there for you to do that or if you mm -hmm. have any um, like female influences that you would, mention in that and kind of what it was like, at least in the beginning of, of modern that. Uh, well, there's a couple different things there. Um, I've always had uh, mentors who were women. Um, I can't remember one who was a man. Um, I often, in college, for example, I, I had to take um, secret creative writing lessons from a woman named Jane Stewart, uh, who was a novelist, uh, because the creative writing department was a hot mess, but also they were, they did, they, they really, weren't being very helpful at all. Um, and uh, Meredith Ann Pierce, a fantasy novelist who was a librarian um, in Gainesville, Florida, was very, very kind. And I would bike over to the library, I would give her a manuscript, and I would bike back the next week, and she would have it all marked up and torn apart and tell me in a no-nonsense way what was wrong with it. Um, so there's that. Then there's the thing that it was always frustrating to me in movies. <laughs> um, like even like the remake of The Thing, you know, you'd have a scientific team and then the woman would be dressed differently or provocatively or not factor in in the same way. Uh, so when they were all nameless, um, I asked myself also, who are they? And I thought, well, what if they're all women? And I slept on that. When I woke up in the morning, I knew who they all were. So that's when that got locked in. So it was a combination of conscious and subconscious, um, wanting to push back against certain stereotypes, but then also waiting to see if it made sense in this context, and it did. Um, and uh, I think in part my subconscious reacts to readers being receptive to things and you know like for example I could tell the difference uh, in my events in terms of the ratio of men to women who were coming out um, the reviews were very kind about my portrayals even though to be honest if you think about it portraying four women in the wilderness is very different from 
the training for women in a city and society moving through everything else. Um, and so my subconscious, again, reacts to that. And so that's, I think, also why um, I felt like I've been given permission um, to write more. Well, I don't write, I, I don't really write that much about men. I don't know why. I don't know if that's a good answer or not. <laughs> it is the only answer I have. All right, let's all give Jeff Vanmeer a round of applause. Thank you very much.